colleagues, welcome to uh, a very special uh, debate. And as you gather and move to your seats, I'm going to ask if the house lights can come up as much as possible. Uh, and it's great that a few people have announced their arrival uh, in new and exciting ways. <laughs> I hope you're OK there. Uh, this is an opportunity for us colleagues to have a conversation over the next hour and a quarter uh, with four remarkable individuals who we have called game changers. And I want to just introduce them first by name and very briefly by title because in a moment we'll return and ask each of them to tell something of their own story. So, to ensure that you all know who is before you, to my immediate left, Dr. Naif El Mutua, creator, the 99, clinical director of the SUA Centre for Psychological Counselling and Assessment in Kuwait, and I've asked permission from each of our game changers if I can address them by their Christian name, and they have generally, generously said yes. So, Naif, welcome. Uh, Reza, it's easy for me, because that is your name, and uh, the title by which you go. Uh, Reza is the founder of The Inner World. He is a photojournalist with National Geographic uh, in Iran and France, but of course is known internationally for his work. So, Reza, it's wonderful to have you with us. Can I then introduce Reverend John P. Foley, who is the Executive Chair of the Christo Ray Network of Schools in the USA. And uh, Brother John, John, people will know you uh, by, they'll be able to remember you by your dress. Thank you very much. And can I finally introduce uh, Ms. Brooktwet Tigabu, who is the General Manager and Co-Founder of WizKids Workshop. She's also the 2010 Rolex Young Laureate uh, from Ethiopia. So, Brooke DeWitt, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Colleagues, uh, just to introduce uh, this debate, and before I move to our four panel members, can I remind you that this is day two of WISE, and the focus of this session is on achieving effective reform. Now, it's clear that from the last session yesterday, we are rethinking innovation in education and how we go about that work. I think what's been clear to a number of us, even as recently as the opening session this morning, is that innovation and change comes from both within the broader system of education and from outside. And the delight this morning is that we have game changers who work within and outside of what we might regard as being the formal learning systems uh, in their respective geographies. The other point I think that we do need to make is that game changes is a word that's used to describe both people and practices. Uh, Tom Bentley in the opening session this morning talked about my school as being a game changer. I would have thought that the introduction of an iPad might be a game changer. We are talking about game changers as people this morning. And so it is clear that in the space of education and learning, we are not simply talking about best practices and spreading those. We are talking about next practices. We are talking about innovation that ultimately might lead to significant change beyond the origin of where the work commenced. So I want to argue that in the spirit again of this morning's conversation, the change that we're talking about is not necessarily top-down or bottom-up. I think we're going to hear from game changers where your work has changed practices, it's changed organisations, it potentially has established new platforms, it has inspired some movement. Uh, in fact, it could change the way in which culture and ideology affect learning. I think we need to ensure that in this session this morning, we invite our four game changers to say something more about the really powerful ways in which learning can be affected and how we can think differently about learning, not necessarily in terms of scaling practice up, but its influence over people. And that can be at multiple levels. So it's in that spirit we're going to have the conversation. I've asked our four panel members if they would be kind enough to allow a three-part dialogue 
before we immediately open it up to all of us. Uh, Natalie, I know that this is in two parts. It needs to be both a dialogue here and then a dialogue and conversation with everybody. We do have, of course, the opportunity for people to join us uh, on MyWise, and also uh, the Twitter tag for this particular session has been communicated, so we will pick up on tweets as we go through the session, both from this room and from outside, and we'll try and do justice to that. But I've indicated uh, to our panel members with their agreement that we might try three brief conversations. The first is I'm going to ask each to say a word about themselves and their story in their own words. What is the project that, in a sense, is the one that has brought you here uh, and allowed us to call you a game changer, even if you are resisting that language? At the moment, can you just accept that you are and say a word about the project and yourself in relation to that work? That's round one. The second round, I'm going to ask if they might say something about the conditions for success on reflection. Why is it? that in fact your work became successful and became successful beyond potentially the location of your original intent. Because I think it will help us to understand the nature of game changing. And then the third round I'm going to say, but it can't have all been easy. It must have been tough. Were there long nights? Were there nightmares? Were there challenges that you just didn't think you'd ever get through? So in the third round, I'm going to say, tell us something about the challenges and how you overcame them. So, Naif, let me start with you. Say a word in three minutes about you and your story. Sure. So uh, my parents changed the game with the biggest mistake of their lifetime. When in 1979, they put me on an airplane from Kuwait and accidentally sent me to a Jewish summer camp in New Hampshire, which I ended up going to for years before realizing what it was. And actually, my own kids go there now, because it was, it's secular. It just happened to be the 90% of the kids there were Jewish. And that kind of had me in two cultures in the very beginning. And, and uh, just you know, learned, a lot of the, learned that a lot of the facts that were taught to me in this part of the world were actually fiction, and I returned the favor. And um, being, being the father of five young boys, um, I became very increasingly upset about what their role models were uh, in our neck of the desert. And, and what, one of the stories I'd like to tell is, you know, one of the hats I wear is I lecture at the medical school in Kuwait, and every year I give the students two articles, one from the New York Times, one from New York Magazine. I take away the name of the writer, the city, everything's gone except the facts, and I ask them to read it. The first one is about a group called the Party of God who wants to ban Valentine's Day because Valentine's a Christian saint. Red is made illegal, no, no flowers that day, any boys and girls caught flirting get married off immediately. And the second one is about a woman complaining because six bearded men in minivans pull up on the street and interrogate her for talking to a man who wasn't related to her, and I ask the students where they think these things took place. The first one, they say Saudi. The second one, they're split between Saudi and Afghanistan. What blows their mind is the first one took place in India. It was the party of a Hindu god. It had nothing to do with this town. The second one took place in upstate New York. It was an Orthodox Jewish community. Now, both, re both communities reacted to this thing positively. Both said this was Talibanization. So the Hindus in India said, dude, Hindus don't act this way. The, Jew the, the Jewish woman in, in New York said, this is, these guys are stupid Talibans about the Jewish men. But my students in Kuwait said, it's us. And when a group starts to self-identify as extreme, we have a huge problem. And so for me, what I wanted to do is to go back to the same sources that the bad guys have pulled out their messages and weaponized our religion and put in their place positive, peaceful messages. Because my theory was, if I can link more positivity to the same source, I can de-link them from the religion. Yeah. And so I started this eight years ago with a crazy idea of creating superheroes called the 99, which we based on Islamic archetypes, yet be secular in nature. Uh, be, ver, ver, because the only thing that beat extremism in Europe in the 15th century was arts and culture, and that's what has to happen in 15th century Islam. And so basically, by going back to the same content and having content that's inspired by the religion, that's secular, versus content that is the religion, which only a small minority of people can tell you what it means and doesn't mean. And so I started as a comic book series, um, completely secular, the 99 are from 99 different countries, they're boys and girls, some cover their hair, some don't. The idea is inclusivity, not exclusivity. Started it from Kuwait, worked with the same people that write Batman and Power Rangers and et cetera, the same artists. The comic book's out in 12 languages now, we just sold the license in France, so it's IP from Kuwait that's actually been able to go global. Theme Park opened in Kuwait a couple years ago, and the TV series launches globally in January. Um, we've sold it to Cartoon Network in Asia, sold it to NBC here, uh, Discovery Networks in America, again, something based out of Kuwait that's gone global. And basically, the, 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 the storylines, because I'm a firm believer that media doesn't just reflect reality, media can create reality. Mm -hmm. And one of the lessons learned for me from the Cosby Show was that the Cosby Show didn't just change 
how white Americans saw black Americans, it changed how black Americans saw themselves. And I feel that if you tell a kid enough times that they're stupid, they're gonna start believing that they're stupid. But if you tell them enough times that they're a terrorist, they're gonna start believing that too. Tell me this. Um, do you, did you consciously think about the way in which this would spread? So in other words, I'll come back in detail to the way in which you went about the work, but was it at the outset intentional that you would use go beyond comic books to media to television programs that and you wanted to get into young people direct not mediated through schools but direct to young people Th that was all intentional but but could i actually achieve it or not that was more of a dream yeah but but yes i mean that's why the characters are from different countries yep. part of that was solving a problem that we have in this region where you have ministries of information that can just take something off the air whenever they want yeah so for me to take investors money because i mean we i mean we've raised millions of tens of millions of dollars for this project and and uh, from private sector individuals and have created almost a thousand jobs in the last eight years working on it and so for me th that risk of of the ministries had to be mitigated and the way to mitigate it was two ways number one make sure that the the characters and the concept is global in nature, so work with top tier creators in Hollywood for the animation series, in New York for the comic book series, but also, you know, so, but also the other part is have the IP protected in New York versus in Kuwait where there's not really much protection. So that's, that's but, but then, you know, they, but as my mentor, one of my mentors says, you can make the best dog food in the world, but the dogs don't eat it. Right. Yeah, so the exactly. in intent is great, but... <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Okay, we're gonna come back. Th this is where we're setting up stories so that uh, your attention is going to be held. Breathtaking, right, as you actually think about the next part of the story. But hit the pause button for one moment on Naev. Reza, uh, welcome, and just say something about, I don't know how you're gonna tell your story in three minutes. Uh, I, I, Started as a photojournalist, a photographer, traveling all over the world for more than 30 years and covering 112 countries for National Geographic and all the big publications. And spending like 25 years out of the 30 years in the war zones and the conflict and refugee camps and with the human disaster. This was all what I was doing. And by being there, suddenly I realized that the, the destruction that happening in these places, it is not only a destruction of the buildings, it is not only destruction of the roads, but the main and the biggest destruction happening in the world, it's a destruction of the culture, a destruction of the human relation, a destruction of the souls. And then I realized that the most of the NGOs, even the UN works, it is only focused on the building, rebuilding the reconstru and reconstructing the physical destruction. That they are coming and building schools versus of creating the education. The building, it, uh, it doesn't bring the education to you, you know. The, the, when you build a hospital, it is not that you are helping the health issues. These are the two different things. So I thought that the 21st century need a new type of the organization. It's a new type of the NGOs, which is not only going to bring bread and bread to the people, but giving them the capacity and training them to take their destinies in their hand. This was the whole concept which I had. Then obviously, as a photographer, what is the most important thing which I know it's happening in the world, it's uh, we are entering the 21st century, which is going to be century of the images. We are going to wear that uh, a new language, which is image language, it's going to be invented and all the human, they would be connected to each other through images. That is how I started on my own launching this AINA Award in 2001, based on the, my experience on the field, which was the first time was in Afghanistan. 2001 Afghanistan was the most difficult place in the world to launch an NGO. And it still is a difficult place. And in 10 years, as a pilot project, which I did here, then I started moving around and other countries also. But the main concept was, if we can help a thousands in Afghanistan, mainly women, mainly of most of them the women, to train them and to become the, the, the journalists, to become the filmmakers, to hold photographer, to radio presenters, and push the women and men in a very high level 
create the media in their own countries. Now that this media, it is meaning that creating communication tools, creating communication tools between the people themselves, but also to the world. So what we have done in the 10 years in Afghanistan, like trainings a thousands of the Afghan women and men to become a very good level all kind of the media related journalists, writers, photographers, and give them the possibility, not only train them, but give them the possibility to create their own business. Well, that is how comes the role of the Ashoka, that I'm a senior fellow for this creating this social entrepreneur. And I help the Afghan women train them. Then they, they start having their own TVs, their own radio. We launch Afghan women radios, the first one in the world, which is called Afghan Women Voices, and it is Women for Women Radio. And it is just uh, blow up. It's like yeah. five million people listening. Yeah. We launched a project of the educational, informal visual education, which later we will talk about it. Yeah. But having this uh, uh, mobile cinemas going village to village and showing images and educating the women, bringing everything necessary to the houses. We bring the education to the houses using what is the, the 21st century's technology, which is the radio, which is the magazine, which is the pictures, images. This is the whole concept which I'm working on it, saying that the 21st century education is the key, obviously, everywhere. education through images is important, and we have to train people in each country that will talk local languages, talking from within, inside, to their own peoples. That's, this is the main concept of the work which I was doing beside my photographer work. Yeah. And, and the power of images and of communication tools. The uh, focus on young women in particular in multiple countries, but children as well? Absolutely. What we have done, for example, the many of the girls, they don't go to the school in Afghanistan. Yeah. They can't go. And I was from the beginning against the construction of the schools yeah. in the south of Afghanistan, saying that if you build the schools, they are going to kill the teachers, they are going to kill the girls and their fathers. Let's find a way to bring the education to the houses. Yeah. That's what we did. We created radio programs for the children, for the women and the girls, and we created a magazine special magazine booklets which is distributed free because it's for the children yeah. and Taliban they don't care about. Fantastic. Okay. So that's how we bring the education to the houses, to using the new medium and the, which is media images and the waves, radio waves. So we need to come back and understand how that concept could have had that spread and that influence across multiple countries. Um, so hit the pause button there for a moment. John, um, Tell us your story, and I'm going to ask you in advance to at least make a link with Peru. Okay. I'm happy to make the leap, and I'm also happy to be here. I'm very grateful to the Qatar Foundation for organizing this, this whole discussion and um, how, how ho hopeful it is that people get together and actually talking and seriously about education. It's been a while since I've seen that, and uh, maybe never, so I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, my, my story begins, um, I, went, I, I lived and worked in Peru, in South America. Um, I'm from Chicago, but um, the, my colleagues in Chicago asked me to go uh, to Peru and to work there, and I thought I had um, established my roots there for the rest of my life. I was there for 34 years, and uh, I, I certainly wor worked with, you can't be in a place like Peru without working with needy people. So. Um, I was there for I was there for uh, 34 years, and one fine day, I got a letter saying, "Would you consider coming back to Chicago, because uh, we'd like to organize a school for the Latino community here?" And um, so I said, "Okay, let's give it a try." Um, so I'm, my, my experience is from the uh, private sector uh, in the United States. That means paying sector, and so that 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 limits us. This isn't the public system. But uh, hold on, I hope I think we really have something to contribute. Um, so we w I went back and we began to organize the school. That was part of a team. And we began to organize the school for needy people in the Latino community in Chicago. And we began to organize the, uh, organize the school. But the, how in the world were we ever going to pay for this? Because the, it was, the school was, uh, by definition, an inner city school 
uh, were, and we even said, you have to show how much you make, and if you can afford to pay for this, then you can't come. So it's a school exclusively for needy young people, for needy young men and women. Uh, it's a secondary school. So um, we, we tossed that idea around, and we finally ended up hiring a consultant and asked him, give us some ideas on how to pay for a school where the people don't have the money to pay for it. Great idea, great question. Um, and th this person came back and said, what if every student had a job? And that's the essence of our system. Our schools are two things. Our schools are schools, academic institutions, and they are also temporary employment agencies. The, the young people who go to our schools are our students, and they are our employees. So we find jobs for them, and uh, once, once every week, a day every week, every student is out working at a job earning um, 60 or 70 percent of the cost of their private education. Um, the, now, that, that's, that's how it got started. And uh, the idea here is to tell a little about ourselves. You can learn a lot about me when I say that I had no idea of the power of this, of this model. I had no idea the results. The results were, as a matter of fact, they were paying 60 to 70 percent of the cost of their private education. But that was minimal. What was, the, what was, what was just over the top was how these students grew in self-esteem, uh, self-knowledge, hope for the future, that there was a place for them in, the, in, the, in corporate America, that it wasn't a door that was closed to them. Uh, they got excited about life. They got excited about going to school. Isn't that a wonderful discovery? Get excited about going to school. Our kids, our kids uh, are more often absent on a day when there's class than when they go to the job. When they like, what they like most about working, what, what they like most about being in one of our schools is that they have the job. And they're, because they're treated, they're, in Chicago, you go up to the, the, um, the Sears Tower, no longer called that, but the Sears Tower in Chicago, and all, this, this young person has never even been on an elevator or a revolving door. And all of a sudden, they go up to the 40th floor, and they have, they have a desk where they're, where they're doing minimal, in the sense, they're real jobs, but, and, they're, and they're real jobs that have, they have to hire somebody for them anyway. So we say, don't hire off the street, hire us, because yeah. we will, we will, we will uh, follow up. And anyway, that's our system. And John, tell me this. You started with one school. Where are you now? We have 24 schools in, in 10 years. Well, this whole thing started in 1996. And our first replication was in 2001. And uh, today we have 24 schools, and we have like five more in the pipeline. That, uh, and that the work has been noticed a wee bit. Uh, there has been some acknowledgement about this work. I just want to embarrass you for a moment. I mean, uh, there, tell us why it is that people picked up on this in such a significant way at the level of the media. You've received awards. You've had right. acknowledgements from the president. Because, because, Tony, it's a win-win-win situation. Everybody wins. The, 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 the companies love the fact that kids are working in their office. Yeah. They love the fact that this youthful spirit is among them. They love the fact that, uh, that they feel like they're doing something for the world they live in. And, uh, the, of course, the kids are getting a great education. Um, and, and, and everybody's winning. It, it, it works for everybody involved. Okay, we've got to come back, and there must be some hard yards here, so I just want to I'll get that story later. Uh, Brooke Twitt, welcome, uh, and tell us a wee bit about um, yourself and WizKids. Okay. Well, I was a school teacher, and I teach uh, primary school. And in 2005, my, I, I usually, when I was a teacher, I spent a lot of time making teaching aids and because we don't have much resource, so I spend time making posters, putting them on the wall, and the rain comes and wash them down. So that kind of uh, experience is like everyday uh, situation. And with my husband in 2005, we decided to uh, start Whiskey's Workshop. And the reason was that there is no public kindergarten in Ethiopia, and I know children come with no preparation to school and not having or uh, good experience or not liking to stay in the school at the result. So we decided to start a media organization, getting children ready to school by providing education through television. So, uh, which is similar, I yeah. mean, we all... Uh, I, as I listen to all, uh, everyone's story, we relate uh, to each other. 
So we created High Loves Learning, the first educational television program in our language. And uh, I mean, at the beginning, my husband and I did everything. I made the puppets, I did the voice. <laughs> we did uh, from right. Home. Yes, from home. Actually, we turned our living room to studio, and we did everything in the house. And um, so we did research and the stories and uh, puppet filming, animation, everything until the end of the production. And we, we went out to the uh, broadcaster, which we, have, we, un, we only have one broadcaster and one channel. So, you know, we have to get it on there. The whole idea, the motivation for us was to get masses of children mm. and, you know, getting edu quality education to them at their house because there's no preschool, like I said. So, um, so we went to the, the, the broadcaster and they were happy at the beginning and we managed to broadcast it and uh, we're reaching about 5 million children uh, through our program. The, the joy of having this conversation immediately after this morning's opening session, where I thought Tom Bentley tried to position the challenge about what a system of learning might be, an ecosystem of learning, and this is not in the terms of a system of education that is bound by the institutionalised school. I mean, here we are, with all four of you, having broken through that formal, informal thought completely differently about the way in which you were going to reach young people and how you were going to invest in their learning. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to understand that this is absolutely the future of learning across the globe. So go back and tell us a wee bit about the success factors that really made a difference. I want to return to you about some of the challenges, but when you think about starting in your own home and thinking about how you're going to create a platform that's going to reach millions of young kids, yet what did you have in your head as the two or three factors that were going to make a difference? Or, on reflection, what were the two or three things that really were the main reasons for your success? Um. I think the first thing I would say, the commitment we had, my husband and I, we put everything we have, the time, the love, the, uh, even our saving, everything to, uh, to make this program successful. And we had a supportive environment as well, like uh, the families and friends who contribute their voices, artwork, anything to help this uh, project succeed. And um, the other thing is that we... Um, we were first to, to market. We were the first uh, yeah. program using the local language, so it was amusing for uh, even adults. I mean, we, this is the program, you know, uh, produced for children under seven, you know, for preschoolers, but 15 years old write us later saying, you know, yeah. we love this program. Parents talk about it. So. And you're now doing programs for older age groups. Yes. Yeah. We, now we are doing it to yeah. other programs, but... Um, but the Tsai Loves Learning, the preschool program, was uh, uh, very successful. I mean, it's still successful. Lots of uh, children watch it every week. And uh, I think the main factor, I would say, is that uh, the commitment we had and the supportive environment uh, from um, families and also uh, the broadcaster as well. Because if it wasn't on air, yeah. then we, could, we couldn't reach. 